Okay, thanks so much, everyone. Okay. We're gonna go ahead and get started, so if I could have your attention. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Maggie LaPointe. I'm one of the marshals for the graduating class of 2022. And on behalf of the class marshals, I'd like to welcome you to the third lecture of the 2022 Last Lecture Series. The Last Lecture Series presents an opportunity for select faculty members to provide guidance and to impart final words of wisdom for our graduating class. Last week, we kicked off the series hearing from professors John Hansen and Molly Brady. Today, we will hear from Professor Nico Bowie, and tomorrow we will have our final installment of the lecture series, hearing from Professor Stephanie Robinson on Friday, April 22nd. Before we begin, I'd like, you to, like to remind you that this lecture is being recorded. Um, there's also food in the back, so if you haven't had a chance to get some, feel free to go. Um, we're just going to get started now. And now, it is my honor to introduce Professor Nico Bowie. Professor Bowie received a BA in history from Yale, and both a JD and PhD in history from Harvard before clerking for Judge Jeffrey Sutton of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circus, Circuit and Justice Sonia Sotomayor of the U.S. Supreme Court. He continues his impressive work here as a faculty member, teaching courses in federal constitutional law, state constitutional law, and local government law, and researching critical legal histories of democracy in the United States. As if all this weren't enough, Professor Bowie is on the boards of the ACLU Massachusetts, Lawyers for Civil Rights, Mass Votes and People's Parity Project, and litigates criminal and civil appeals. To top it all off, he's an avid marathoner and a beloved teacher, having won the Sachs Freund Award for teaching excellence from last year's graduating class. Please join me in welcoming Professor Nico Bowie. Thank you so much, and thank you all for coming. Um, <laughs> it's really great to see you all in person for Many of you who were in my um, 1L Con Law class in 2020, uh, there was a bit of an interruption. Um, but it's really great to be in the same room again together. Um, so it's an honor to be here and to both reflect on the last three years as well as to celebrate all of you for persevering and making it through an incredibly challenging and disruptive time. Um, you know, I know that <laughs> none of us anticipated what your three years in law school or four years in law school or five years in law school would have been like, but um, I'm just really proud of you for persevering. Um, as some of you know, this year has been pretty challenging for me as well. Um, my mom passed away from Alzheimer's a few months ago. Uh, she would have been 72 this week. And before she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, she was a professor here for almost 20 years. Um, during her time here, she was full of advice for graduating students, so I'm sure she would have loved to be here, and I will try to impart some of the wisdom that she would have imparted um, for how to live a fulfilling career. And I think her favorite piece of advice was to get as far away as possible from Harvard Law School. <laughs> so, <laughs> to be clear, my mom loved her job. She loved teaching. She loved you. She loves students. And she loved watching students go off and do really important work after graduating. She loved seeing how students came in to the law school ready to change the world and eliminate the injustices around us and going off and accomplishing some of these goals. She recognized that if law school were little more than a finishing school, just a place where you learn the etiquette of how to conduct a cocktail party without embarrassing yourself or how to talk to clients while wearing a suit or simply how to be a member of America's elite it's not a really great institution that to exist in a democracy. What's the point of Harvard Law School if all we're doing is selecting people to go off and reinforce the status quo? That's not very fulfilling. And so she saw law school as a place where people who were eager to combat injustice would get the tools necessary 
to forge justice out of inequity, who could see justice around them and change it. For her own part, my mom came to law school because of an event she saw on TV when she was 12 um, in 1962. So at the time, the University of Mississippi, Ole Miss, uh, was racially segregated and proud of it, uh, even though the Supreme Court eight years earlier had held that racial segregation was unconstitutional. Uh, the elected leadership of Mississippi said, okay, so what? It refused to admit a single black student, even after public pressure, even after federal lawsuits. And only a handful of schools anywhere in the South were complying with the ruling in Brown. A lawyer helped to change that, Constance Baker Motley. Uh, she was the first woman hired by the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Uh, she wrote the complaint at issue in Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, she was the legal strategist for the civil rights movement. She represented boycotters. She represented people conducting sit-ins. She represented freedom writers. And she also represented James Meredith, who defiantly declared he was going to be the first black person to attend the University of Mississippi. Motley, as Meredith's attorney, shepherded his claims through the state courts of Mississippi, through federal courts, to the Supreme Court. She risked the threats of violence from people around her. She walked arm in arm with James Meredith as he attempted to register over and over with the university authorities who rejected his claims. And after a period of years, Motley finally was able to walk with Meredith to the doors of Ole Miss and actually register him as a student. And so when my mom, this 12-year-old girl, saw this on TV, she saw Constance Baker Motley, this elegant, proud black woman, in the face of all of this protest around racial integration, and said, that is what I want to do when I grow up. I want to be a civil rights attorney. And so she went to law school. My mom did not enjoy law school very much. Um, don't worry, she didn't go here. Um, but she did, ultimately enjoy, or she did ultimately join the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, the same place where Constance Baker Motley worked. Uh, so she literally followed in Motley's footsteps to Mississippi, to Alabama, uh, as she attempted to not only register black folks to vote, but also defend their claims in court when white registrars, or registrars at the voting booth said that you cannot participate, you cannot register. Even after my mom eventually became a law professor here and taught in elite law schools for decades, she maintained that her favorite job, the one where she felt the most fulfilled, was working at LDF. In contrast with law schools, where uh, many students and even some professors spend their days chasing gold stars and affirmation, at LDF, what my mom found so valuable was she was a member of a team. She was part of a group of people who had a shared purpose. And that purpose was to change the injustice around them. It was not self-promotion, it was not self-congratulation, it was change. Take something that is wrong and fixing it, making it good. And it was that theory of change, the theory that we can go out and represent black voters and actually change the system to eliminate and take down the pillars of racial segregation and disenfranchisement that for my mom was at the time meaningful and persuasive. It was a meaningful and persuasive theory of change. So the idea of developing your own theory of change is what I want to talk to you all about today. It's a simple concept. A theory of change is just your answer to the question of how does change happen? The world today looks very different than the world 10 years ago when I was a student at HLS. Uh, it looks 
extremely different from the world 60 years ago when Constance Baker Motley escorted James Meredith to Ole Miss. And the world tomorrow will look very different from the world now. So even though change can feel hopeless at times, change is also inevitable. It is going to happen. The world will look different. And so even though the world today is full of injustices that can appear like natural features of the political landscape, injustices that can look like mountains or oceans, mountains erode, sea levels rise, change happens, and even a racial caste system that has existed in a country for decades, if not its entire existence, can be eroded. Industrial revolutions and political revolutions can make change happen far faster than you might expect. So my mom went to law school. Her goal in going to law school in the first place was to learn how to catalyze the changes around her how to see the injustice of a racial apartheid system and build multiracial democracy out of it. Her theory of change, her answer to the question, how does change happen, is that multiracial democracy would replace the decades-long period of mass disenfranchisement if she took the claims of disenfranchised voters to court, to federal court. Because at the time, there was a law, the Voting Rights Act, that federal courts would interpret <laughs> to eliminate disenfranchisement. At the time when my mom was in law school, this was a persuasive theory of change. If we take claims to federal court, they will do something about it. And it was a meaningful theory of change. She cared deeply about democracy. And what she went off to do after graduating was directly related to the change that she found so compelling for herself, so important that it gave her life fulfillment. This theory of change was realistic. It was not a pipe dream. It was not a hope. It was not, if I do this, perhaps something in the future will be better. It was strategic. She had thought through, if I do this, change will happen. So now that most of you have spent your own three years in law school, let me pose the question to you. What is your theory of change? So you may have seen the title of this as last lecture and assume that I would do all the talking and that, that was a reasonable assumption. Um, so I'll give you some help in thinking about how to answer this question of what is your theory of change. So think about it, because this is a delaying tactic. So I want you to start by thinking about the people close to you. Think about the people who you called when you found out that you got into Harvard Law School. Think about the people who you were excited to help, too excited to work with the people whose opinion of you really matters. Maybe it's your parents, or your community, or your spouse. Maybe it's past professors. Who are your people? And once you have someone in mind, once you have your people in mind, I want you to think next of what is a problem facing your people? What is a change that they want to see? It might be the problem that brought you to law school in the first place. It might be a big social change, like making sure that the United States has a policy of responding to the climate change that's going to envelop all of us, whether we have the policy or not. Maybe it's responding to mass incarceration and 
making the criminal legal system more equitable and fair. Maybe it's building democracy and expanding the right to vote. Maybe the change facing your people, the people, or the change that your people need is more personal. Maybe it's financial insecurity and solving that, changing that, so that your parents can retire with dignity. Maybe it's you know someone or you want to know someone who is facing the weight of the state as they attempt to put them in a cage for years. And you want to change their life so that they can live with their family instead of alone in isolation. Maybe it's people who are losing their homes and whose lives you can change by representing them. What is the change that your people need? And so think about what is the change that you could see happening for your people in the next 15 years? 15 years is a very long time. To give you some context, in 1848, the United States was at war to expand slavery into Texas. 15 years later, in 1863, the president was abolishing slavery in the South. In 1954, racial segregation was constitutional. In 1969, there was not only a Civil Rights Act and a Voting Rights Act, but there were people on the moon. <laughs> 15 years ago, in 2007, there was no iPhone. There was no WhatsApp. <laughs> Twitter and YouTube were barely a year old. Netflix's business model was sending DVDs in the mail. <laughs> and if something was going viral, that meant there was a pandemic. <laughs> so 15 years is a long time. What is a change that your people need that you can imagine happening in 15 years? And as you're thinking about this, I'll pose the last question which is, what is your plan after you graduate? Does it have anything to do with the change that your people need? I'm not asking you to imagine a consistent plan for the next 15 years. I have no idea where I'm going to be in 15 years. But can you imagine doing something that relates to the change that the people who you most care about want. Among the many, many paths that remain open to you right now, how do they relate to the change that your people need? And so putting this all together, how would you answer this question? How would you complete the following sentence? The change I care about, the change my people care about, will happen if I pursue the path I am on because. The change I care about, the change my people care about, will happen if I pursue the path I am on because. What follows that because? Why don't you take a minute and talk to your neighbor <laughs> and complete the sentence. The change I care about, the change my people care about, will happen if I pursue the path I am on because. Go ahead, we'll reconvene in a few minutes.
Thank you. So let's take two more minutes. All right, so sorry to interrupt. Sorry to interrupt, but I'm going to do it anyway. So what did you think? Is, is this an easy exercise? <laughs> is it pretty challenging? I think it's a, a little too late in the semester for cold calling, but <laughs> I would love to hear some examples of your answers to this question. The change you care about will happen if you pursue the path you are on because, does anyone want to volunteer? I will wait you out.
Well, I'm glad you volunteered on behalf of him. <laughs> but yeah, you might, you might summarize that as to the extent that we maintain a, pers like a sense of perspective and self-reflection as well as a commitment to constantly be in contact with the people we care about, to ask them for guidance, the change we care about will happen, and at least we won't stray too far away from working toward it. Any others? Yeah. Great. So by acquiring power, by joining powerful institutions, by joining places that can exercise and change and influence the law, of course that's a way of changing the law to make it better, to make it improved. So as you might have realized from this exercise, it, it's a pretty difficult one. And not all theories of change are the same. So some theories that you might have tossed out may not sound as persuasive as they might be in your mind before you have to articulate it. Some theories of change might be more meaningful to you than others. So for example, if one of the changes in the next 15 years that you're hoping to realize is to put your parents on a sound financial footing, then going to work and making a lot of money over the next 15 years is a very persuasive theory of change. But to the extent that the theory of change that you know, most drives you is also to end mass incarceration, it's not really persuasive at all to say, well, you will change that by giving your children a financial future so that they can go to an elite school and one day they, 15 years or 30 years from now, might graduate from HLS so that they will be in the same position that you're in now. So the point of this exercise and the reason I am here today is not that you need a persuasive theory of change right now. It's not be disappointed if you can't answer that question right now. But I do want you to constantly think about what is your theory of change and to reevaluate it over time. Indeed, I hope and I expect that your theory of change will itself change. Over my mom's career as a civil rights lawyer and ultimately a law professor, she encountered three broad categories of theories of change. Each of them have their perils, but she found that some of them were more persuasive and meaningful to her than others. So when my mom began her career after she graduated from law school in the 1970s, uh, she embraced the main theory of change promoted by law schools everywhere, then and now, a theory of change embodied by advocacy that this is still the predominant theory that I'm sure most of your classes here embraced. On a personal level, zealous advocacy obviously can change the circumstances of someone's life. If you are representing someone who is about to lose their home and can keep them in their home, that is meaningful change. 
zealous advocacy can also be the difference between spending your life in that home and spending your life in a cage. Advocacy can change lives. On a social level, litigators like Charles Hamilton Houston, Constance Baker Motley, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, also demonstrated how advocacy, how arguing on behalf of a client that the law needs to change and encouraging judges to adopt your position can contribute to the eradication of enormous social problems that today might seem permanent. But one thing that my mom realized as a litigator with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund as elsewhere is that advocacy is an effective and a persuasive theory of change, mainly to the extent that you believe that the laws on the books are good and are just being misinterpreted, that judges and other interpreters of the law are open to persuasion, and that you can be the person to persuade them. You need good laws that are just being misinterpreted by judges who if they accept your argument, we'll turn them into how the laws should be. And so when my mom began working at LDF, this was a somewhat realistic position for someone entering voting rights work. That there are good laws on the books, they're just being misinterpreted or not enforced, and by going out and advocating on behalf of her clients, she could encourage federal judges to listen to her. But as Derek Bell, a Harvard Law professor in the 70s and 80s observed at the same time from his experience both on the faculty here as well as as a former litigator with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, advocacy as a persuasive theory of change may reflect some coincidental confluences of, in of interests, an interest convergence. When he was reflecting on the history of Brown versus Board of Education and its aftermath, how the promise of a decision like Brown descended into fights for decades over busing and over desegregation programs and then over simply what did Brown actually mean? Does Brown lead to no desegregation at all? He observed that most black children in the 1930s I mean, I'm sorry, in the 1980s, 30 years after Brown, were attending public schools that were both racially isolated and inferior to what they were in 1953. And so his explanation was that when Brown was decided, there was a consensus among elite white lawyers in the Supreme Court and federal courts and elsewhere that racial segregation in the South was an embarrassment to the United States. And that federal courts were committed to desegregation only to the extent that it served the interest of this elite white constituency. He posed this question as the interest convergence dilemma. And he argued that, quote, the interest of blacks in achieving racial equality through advocacy will be accommodated only when it converges with the interests of whites. However, the 14th Amendment standing alone will not authorize a judicial remedy providing effective racial equality for blacks where the remedy sought threatens the superior societal status of middle and upper class whites. Bell's point, in other words, isn't that advocacy as a theory of social change is always not compelling. It's just that he thought it's compelling only to the extent that interpreters are sympathetic to your perspective. And this might not be a surprising uh, interpretation of the past 50 years if you have taken constitutional law here at HLS and can contrast the types of decisions that the Supreme Court itself was deciding in the 1960s compared to the 1970s. And for Bell, advocacy in the context of a court that was no longer committed to the desegregation ideals of a decision like Brown was not only ineffective, but could actively become harmful in another seminal article that he published called Serving Two Masters, Bell argued that anyone attempting to use advocacy for the purpose of social change, for the purpose of changing the lives not just of your client but the society around you, may lead to a potential conflict of interest between your goals as a lawyer and your client's goals. 
So for Bell, thinking about the question of desegregation, recognize that for him and other attorneys at LDF, the change they wanted was desegregation. The change they wanted was no more racially segregated schools. But for many of his clients, the change they wanted was, I just want to send my kid to a school in which they have uh, up-to-date materials and a good education and teachers who respect them. I actually do not care if they t attend schools with other white children. Desegregation is not the same as a good education. And so to the extent there is a conflict of interest, not just between interpreters and lawyers, but between lawyers and their own clients, advocacy also may not be a persuasive theory of change. So Bell's two criticisms of advocacy as a theory of change, that they rely on this interest convergence between elite communities and lawyers, as well as the interest convergence between lawyers and clients, remain pressing challenges to advocates today, for people today who rely on advocacy as a theory of change. They might be joined by criticisms of Paul Butler, who recently has looked at how, at best, advocacy, even if successful, is only going to enforce existing law. It's only going to be as good as the laws already on the books. So Butler was looking at the effect of consent decrees in places like Ferguson or Chicago or Baltimore after the Department of Justice sued to require city police departments to apply constitutional policing, to police consistent with what the Constitution demanded. And Butler saw that sometimes this is very successful. Consent decrees will require the police to abide by the Constitution. But when it comes to constitutional limits on police conduct, they permit a tremendous amount of state violence against black people. That it is constitutional for police officers to stop people and demand their driver's license and to put them in jail if they've committed a misdemeanor for 48 hours. That the Constitution, as it exists right now, may permit too much violence. So my mom loved being an advocate, but also recognized that she had to keep her theory of change up to date. It had to remain persuasive and meaningful for her. And so in part, out of similar concerns about advocacy, my mom transitioned to a different theory of change, one built around mobilizing. The idea behind mobilizing is that social change sometimes just requires getting a ton of people out there to do something getting a ton of people to show up at a march, or a ton of people to show up at a rally, or most importantly, get a ton of people to show up at the polls and vote for a new candidate, to vote for politicians who will change the law. To the extent the law is not on your side, sometimes you need to change that, and not just through litigation, but through legislation. So if enough sympathetic politicians realize they cannot continue without angering too many mobilized constituents, then perhaps they will change the law themselves. Congress in 1964 and 1965 didn't enact the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act merely because they had a change of heart or a different perspective, but because marchers in Selma and throughout the South and on the, uh, the Federal Mall in DC all demonstrated that there was a sufficiently mobilized public that if they didn't listen, they might lose their jobs. So for my mom in the 19, early 1990s, um, Bill Clinton appeared to demonstrate this form of effective mobilization. They had gone to law school together, they were friends, and when he ran for president in 1992, he pledged to adopt creative and effective new methods of enforcing and amending the Voting Rights Act an act that he charged previous administrations with failing to enforce as it should have been enforced. Yet his presidency revealed a problem with mobilization on its own, its transience. After the rally is over and after the votes are cast, what next? It's one thing to get a politician elected and it's another to hold them accountable to the goals they said that they would pursue when they were running. 
And absent a sustained constituency that is always on guard, always mobilized, always ready to fight for what they care about, even the most pressing issues can be blown away by new political winds. Theda Scotchpola, a professor here at the uh, government department, has also described a problem with mobilizing as a theory of change to the extent that it relies on questions of backroom deals and bipartisanship among politicians. That to the extent that your theory of change demands on getting the right people in office so that they can make the right decisions with others, it's a theory of change that can leave people behind. And my mom saw this firsthand in 1993. So at the time, she had just left the NAACP to become a law professor and uh, was nominated by President Clinton to become the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, so the head of the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Bureau, where she would be in charge in part with enforcing and interpreting the Voting Rights Act. It was mobilization that was successful. It was we got the right people in office to make the difference. But once, once my mom was nominated, once other people in Washington saw what she thought about the Voting Rights Act and saw what she thought would improve democracy, things like proportional representation, they charged her with being anti-democratic. She doesn't believe in one person, one vote. She was going to ruin our democracy. She is not American. And the president, with no mobilized, active mobilized constituency pushing him to continue the policies that he had promised to run on when he was first running and before he became president, left my mom to dangle in the wind without defending her and without any need to defend her, ended up withdrawing the nomination on the platform of, oh, I hadn't read her law review articles. I didn't realize what she was calling for. Perhaps I should pick someone different. And so today, we're seeing other pitfalls of mobilization as a theory of change. Um, as Zainab Tefechi has written, it's far easier today than it was in 1963 to get lots of people active and tweeting and uh, ready to campaign for a particular issue with others. Twitter and Facebook and other forms of social media make it far easier to get a lot of people demanding change. Many of you likely took to the streets in 2020 after the murder of George Floyd demanding change. But one essential difference between the mass mobilization of today and much of the mass mobilization of the 1960s is the absence of those sustained relationships that allowed the mobilization to persist after the protest was over, after the issue is no longer viral. In 1963, when politicians looked out on people marching in DC, people who only got there because of word of mouth, because of the distribution of handbills, because of buses, because of all of the limited technology to get people to DC in 1963, they realized that group of people has capacity to really disrupt my life, to really get me out of office if I go home without changing the law. But today, when a politician looks and sees a million people out in the streets or a, tw a tweet that is retweeted 10 million times, it means far less because it represents far less capacity behind that mass mobilization. So mobilizing as a theory of change is powerful, but it also needs to be sustainable. And so after the fiasco that my mom called her disappointment from the Clinton administration, <laughs> she didn't abandon her views about what democracy needs, but instead she started to cultivate the grassroots relationships that she thought the Clinton administration had neglected. Rather than assuming that change will happen simply if we get the right people in office, assuming that they will change the office rather than the office changing them, she embraced a third theory of change, organizing. In contrast with advocacy, 
in which one set of lawyers from Harvard Law School talk to another set of lawyers from Harvard Law School about why they should all listen to the professors at Harvard Law School <laughs> about what the law should look like. And in contrast with mobilization in which people all campaign for a one-time event hoping that that will be enough to just shame people into changing their own values. Organizing is a theory of change built upon the idea that we can build power among ordinary people. So as Marshall Gans has written, organizing is a theory of change built on relationships. It is built on the idea that we all have relationships with other people, our friends, our families, our communities, and our workplaces. And that these relationships are not one way, but interdependent. That we have relationships because we gain things from others, and they gain things from us. And some relationships may be hierarchical. We may work for a particular employer to get a paycheck, but they need us to provide the labor. We may vote for a politician who needs our votes, but we need the politician to change the law. And what's so powerful about this recognition that we all live in interdependent relationships is it's possible to recognize the power we all possess if we take those relationships into account and ask, how can we withhold what we have to demand what we need? As a worker, I alone may not be able to get my employer to listen to me, but if all workers in the building say, we are not going to work until you give us health care, we will go on strike until you listen to our demands, a strike can change a workplace. If one Starbucks says that we are going to unionize and can join with other Starbucks to unionize, the entire company can start to unionize. If one voter recognizes that if we keep electing the same types of politicians, we're not going to have any, uh, make any difference, but if all of us withhold our votes until the politicians listen to our demands, we can elect new leadership. If we decline to shop in a particular business and have a boycott, the business needs our patronage. We need the things from that business. But if we can withhold our consumption, then we can change what the business does. The theory of organizing is a theory built on relationships and the power that comes from leveraging those relationships. It's a power that we all already possess. This is how strikes win contracts. This is how elections win new laws. This is how boycotts win new agreements. And most importantly, this is how social movements move from one victory to the next. Organizing has changed even places like Harvard Law School. So in the early 1990s, Harvard was a place in which the faculty looked out over the countryside, saw the millions of women of color who lived and worked and practiced law, and concluded that none of them were qualified to teach here. Maybe it's a pipeline issue. Maybe just none of them want to do it. But we're looking and we see none that we think are qualified to teach our students. Never in the law school's 150 year history had a black woman taught here. At least not with the protection of tenure that any professor would want. And the faculty did not change this conclusion because it spotted a black woman ready to teach. It did not change its conclusion because the faculty had a collective epiphany and decided, actually, it seems like it would be a good idea to hire a woman of color to teach here. The faculty changed its perspective because of organizing. 
because students demanded change. Students recognize that this law school only functions because of you. Derek Bell, the same professor who had articulated two criticisms of advocacy as a theory of change, went on strike. He took a leave of conscience and said, I am not going to work at a place that refuses to hire a tenured woman of color. Students went on strike. They said, I am not going to attend a classroom and there are zero women of color at this school who can teach. The Women's Law Association adopted an advocacy approach by suing Harvard Law School, saying that the law school was violating the state's anti-discrimination laws. There was a years-long organizing effort to compel the faculty to change its perspective about who is qualified to teach here. All of this pushed Harvard Law School to hire somebody. They looked around and said, please work here. And everyone who they talked to, including my mom, said, hell no. I am not going to enter that environment. I saw what happened to James Meredith at the University of Mississippi. This seems worse. And so it actually took several years of persuasion. But in 1998, in 1998, my mom joined the faculty at Harvard Law School to become the first tenured woman of color to teach here. So it's student organizing. It's organizing by people like you that brought 11-year-old me to Cambridge. The reason that I am here today is because of people like you, because of the power that you already possess, that the power you just have to recognize how to leverage, the power of the relationships that you already maintain, the power of the people you care about, the communities that brought you here, the people who you want to make proud. That is not just a personal relationship. That is potential power. And it's power that can change the world around you. So my mom saw teaching as a form of organizing. When she joined the faculty here, she uh, saw building power among students as her answer to the question of the change that I want to see, the change that matters to the people I care about will happen because I will teach students to recognize the power they have to go out and change the world around us. But of course, that theory of change is only persuasive to the extent that you do go out <laughs> and change the world around us. As Harvard Law School graduates, you are some of the most powerful people on the planet. That is not an overstatement. Some of the most powerful people on the planet. The decisions you make matter, not just to you, not just your family, but to everybody. And so it's important as you begin your careers out of this law school to see yourself as a powerful person. You might think that the injustices that brought you here are permanent, that there isn't much you can do to change them. But there is, and you can. But you need a meaningful and persuasive theory of change for yourself. And so many of you were in my constitutional law class, 
um, where every year I relate a story that Charles Hamilton Houston, the legendary law professor at Howard University Law School, gave to his students, including Thurgood Marshall and other advocates for change in the civil rights movement. And so 75 years ago, he encouraged his students to think like a lawyer. So I want you to go out and think like a lawyer. But he said, thinking like a lawyer embodies three steps. The first step is you have to know what the law is. You have to figure out when is a contract a contract? What is a tort? What is the law? The second is to know how to apply old legal patterns to new situations, to respond to hypotheticals. But if that's all you can do, you know the law and you can apply it to new situations, then Professor Houston said, you are a parasite. You are someone who is going to go out and issue spot and reinforce the status quo. Thinking like a lawyer also requires a third step to know what the law is, to apply it in new situations, and to know what the law should be and how to make it so. So as you go off and you change the law into what it should be, not just reflecting what it is now, don't start by picking just any random issue. I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture that my mom had Alzheimer's, which meant that for the past few years, it was difficult to communicate with her about anything other than the literally most deeply held commitments in her mind. This was tough, but the experience did help me understand and relate to the story of another black civil rights leader who died of Alzheimer's, Ella Baker. Ella Baker was a legendary organizer. She helped found the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. Uh, she worked with Martin Luther King in the Birmingham campaign. She was a prolific organizer.